In this video, I will explain the 9 plus 1 core principles I use when working on software performance optimization. These are principles I have picked up over the years and which have proven quite useful. When using these principles, you can almost always find some performance gains in an unoptimized application. The difference between an unoptimized and a fully optimized software system can be a factor of 10 to 100 in throughput, even a factor of 1000 if the right conditions are present. However, a factor 100 to 1000 performance gain will often require substantial redesign of the system, so it's not something that you can just always get easily. Here are my 9 plus 1 software performance optimization principles. The first 9 principles are optimization techniques, and the last principle is more of a tip to remember during performance optimization. Each of these principles could take one or more videos to cover in detail, so in this video I will primarily explain the basics of each principle to give you an overview of how I approach software performance optimization. The first principle is to look for algorithmic optimizations. In other words, if possible, change to a faster algorithm. You may already have come across algorithmic performance differences when studying sorting and searching algorithms during your education. The second principle is to remove unnecessary instructions in the implementation of your chosen algorithm. If you look at the first code example up here, you can see that we have two identical name.index of calls. Obviously, one of these calls is unnecessary. In the second example here, we have moved the name.index of call up here and assigned the value of this call to a variable. And then this variable is used down here in both of these substring calls. This is an example of removing one of these unnecessary name.index of calls here in the second example here. The third principle is to align your code with how the underlying hardware works. This includes techniques such as instruction reordering, reducing branches, using SIMD instructions, or and using GPU instructions. Additionally, you also need to learn how to access memory in ways that align with how the L1, L2, and L3 caches work in your computer, and you need to access data on the disk in the same way as above and as a rule of thumb that means preferring sequential access to bytes in the memory and on disk rather than random access. In order to use this third principle you will need to acquaint yourself with instruction pipelines in CPUs and also learn how CPU registers and L1, L2 and L3 cache works and also reading from disk. Um, to be fair, sometimes the uh, instruction reordering will be done by a compiler for you, so you may not actually have to do that by hand. But reducing branches and using SIMD instructions and GPU instructions is something that you might have to be more explicit and more conscious about doing. You may also get some help from the um, underlying hardware. Uh, with regards to accessing memory, but you still need to be somewhat conscious of how you access um, data in memory and on disk in order to get maximal performance. The fourth principle is data to CPU proximity. The closer data is to the CPU, the faster it is for the CPU to load that data and process it. That is why we have so many different data caches at different layers, both in the hardware and in the software. The fifth principle is to reduce data size. Reducing the size of data makes it faster to transport from its storage location to the CPU for processing. Common techniques are compression of data, more compact data formats, and more compact data structures in memory. The sixth principle is to minimize action overheads. If setting up an action requires an overhead, try to minimize the number of times that overhead is paid. For instance, imagine if you need to 
send an update to a database. First, you need to connect to the database, then you send the action across. Now, if you then close the connection here, then the next time that you have to send an action to the database, you have to first open the database connection, and then you can send the action to the database. If instead you could send multiple uh, updates to the database after opening the connection, then you would only pay this connection opening overhead one time for all of these actions. Maybe you could even batch up multiple actions um, within a single request to the database, which, uh, which is possible using JDBC batch updates. The seventh principle is idle time utilization. Use the time waiting for external results to occur for doing other work. If you look at the example here on the right, you can see that this thread here, which is inside our system, is sending a request to an external system. And while this external system is preparing the response, this internal thread here is idle. So the green uh, block here is idle time. This time can be utilized for other work. And that is exactly what you're trying to do when using asynchronous communication, such as asynchronous file I.O. or asynchronous network I.O. What you're trying to do is send this request, then go do something else, and then come back when the response uh, has returned from this external system so that you are not wasting this idle time just waiting for the response to come back. The eighth principle is parallelization doing work in parallel on multiple CPUs or computers. That way you can get more work done at the same time. The main parallelization models are parallel workers, assembly line, also known as pipeline parallelism, fork and join or functional parallelism, map reduce, and single threaded concurrency, which is not really parallelism, but can be used for parallelism. And if you start playing around with some of these models, look out for concurrency issues. Here I have illustrated the parallelization models. Up here in, in the left corner, we have the parallel workers model. Each worker here, which can be a thread or a process, gets a task and completes that task uh, independently from the other workers. So there, there's no communication between the workers. Below we have the assembly line or pipeline model. And um, in this model, the uh, entire job is split up into multiple steps in a pipeline. So you have, again, three workers here, but worker one will carry out the first part of the total job, then hand over the job to the second worker, which will um, complete the second part of the job. and the then hand it off to the third worker, which will complete the third part of the entire job. An example of an assembly line pipeline um, implementation could be that the first worker here is loading uh, files from the file system and then handing them off to the work, this worker thread here. This worker thread then unzips these files and then hands them off to this worker, which then processes whatever data is stored inside the zip files. In the middle, we have the fork and join or functional parallelism or map reduce model. The first worker here gets a task, which is then split up into multiple subtasks. It is forked into multiple subtasks. These subtasks are then handed off to other workers, which carry out these subtasks in parallel. The results are sent back to the first worker here, which then joins all these small sub-results into one big result. Over here on the right, I have illustrated single-threaded concurrency. Single-threaded concurrency means that a single thread is making progress on multiple tasks at seemingly the same time, and it does so by first executing a bit of work on the first task, then switching to the second task and carrying out a bit of work on that, and then switching to the third task and executing a bit of work on that task, and then going back up to uh, the first task and executing a bit of that work, etc., etc. Single-threaded concurrency is not truly a parallelization technique as these tasks here are not truly um, carried out in parallel. Rather, the thread that executes them switches 
uh, in between these tasks. So they are carried out in small um, bits, but sequentially. A little bit of this, an increment of this task, and then an increment of this task, and then an increment of this task, sequentially, not in parallel. However, if you run multiple single-threaded concurrency instances here in parallel, you can actually achieve parallelization, but then the model will be more similar to the parallel workers model, except that inside each of these workers here, you will have single-threaded concurrency taking place. The ninth principle is external system interaction optimization. Make sure your application is interacting with the external systems in the most optimal way. This often requires deep knowledge of the external system. For instance, if your app interacts with an SQL database, you need to learn how to use that SQL database in the most optimal way for your use case. This could include such things as query optimizations, batch operations, indexes on tables, and denormalization of tables and data. The plus one principle is measure, don't assume. This is not an optimization technique in itself, but a quality assurance technique intended to make sure you verify that your optimizations actually improve the performance of the software. Measure performance before and after the optimization to verify that the optimization was actually beneficial. Finally, I just want to mention that there are typically two performance optimization modes that developers are in. The first mode is application optimization, and in this mode, you will typically be optimizing for the 80% or the 90% easiest gains, and the last 10-20% gains are sometimes too expensive to justify uh, optimizing for within just a single business case. The second mode is toolkit or platform optimization. And in this mode, you are optimizing for as many gains as possible because you're optimizing a toolkit or platform that are used by many different people or many different uh, organizations. And therefore, it is often easier to justify investing into the last 1% to 5% performance optimizations. That's all for this video about performance optimization. Remember to check out the description below the video for links to related um, videos and articles. And if you like this video, please hit the like button. And if you want to see more videos like this, please subscribe to my channel.